The Dutch Revolt, also known as the Eighty Years' War, was a prolonged armed conflict that took place in the Habsburg Netherlands between Spain and various rebel groups. The rebellion started nominally in 1568, with the execution of Counts Egmont and Horn, and by 1609, a twelve-year truce had been established, revealing most of the outcomes of the conflict. During this time, it passed through different phases and ups and downs, and had a number of surprising and enduring effects on world politics and commerce. The birth of the merchant oligarchy, the creation of one of the greatest global maritime empires based on commerce, and the start of a fresh breeze of freedom and openness in thinking, art, and science were just a few of them. The Low Countries, comprising 17 provinces, were brought under the control of the Dukes of Burgundy in the 14th and 15th centuries. However, each province retained its freedom and adherence to local laws and customs, leading to a fragmented political landscape. In 1549, Emperor Charles V of Spain united the Netherlands provinces through a state-general agreement. But Charles V's successor, King Philip II, faced opposition from the Netherlanders, who viewed him as a foreigner due to his Spanish origins, compared to his father, who was born in Ghent. Further, Philip's demands for the nobility to sign an oath of allegiance led to constitutional concerns and tensions. Religious conflicts also arose due to Philip's strict Catholic policies, including the establishment of bishoprics and the Inquisition in 1565. Iconoclasm began in Ghent, Amsterdam, Leiden, and Utrecht. In 1566, a group of compromise-supporting lesser nobles, known as the Sea Beggars, petitioned the regent, Margaret of Palmer, leading to an accord allowing Protestant worship. However, the deal failed, and the Spanish army, under the command of the Duke of Alba, was sent to suppress the rebellion. William of Orange emerged as the leader of the opposition. Despite some initial successes by the Spanish, the sea beggars and rebels were able to gain control of several cities with the support of defectors. The Spanish leadership became divided over the prospect of a protracted war in Holland and Zeeland, where William had significant support. In 1573, Philip II replaced Alba with Don Luis de Requesens. William of Orange took advantage of Spanish indecision and united the states of Holland and Zeeland in 1575. The rebels also created flooded areas and made it difficult for the Spanish to recapture rebel cities. The financial crisis and failed negotiations between Philip II and the rebels worsened the situation. The Spanish troop mutinies in 1576 also brought the provinces of the Low Countries together. And William's supporters and Catholic loyalists in the Dutch area signed the Pacification of Ghent, where they agreed to set aside religious differences and expel the Spanish. Philip appointed Don Juan of Austria as governor-general, but infighting and power struggles among the provinces persisted. In 1578, the northern provinces formed the Union of Utrecht, establishing the United Provinces, while the southern provinces established the Union of Arras, accepting Philip II's rule. The Act of Abjuration in 1581 deposed Philip II as sovereign of the Netherlands, further solidifying the provinces' move towards independence. In fact, Dutch independence truly began long back in the 14th century, when the independent water boards of various town councils of the provinces undertook reclamation projects on their own in the 15th century, involving sizable yearly expenditures for dikes, sluices, mill races, windmills, and polders that reclaimed land and shielded the various provinces from the sea. Further, in the absence of significant agricultural practices due to frequent flooding, the inhabitants of the Netherlands relied heavily on handicrafts and trades to support their livelihoods. And by the 16th century, the Dutch merchants and mariners of Holland and Zeeland had a significant share of the seaborne trade between the Baltic and Western Europe, primarily due to the geographical position of the lowlands by the North Sea, which allowed them to offer lower freight rates and undersell. A characteristic feature of the seaborne trade in the Northern Netherlands was the Redridge, a flexible cooperative shipping enterprise where a group of people would buy, own, build, charter, or freight a ship and its cargo. This practice facilitated widespread investment in shipping and related industries with a wide diffusion of ownership, 
integrating the mercantile and maritime communities. This elevated the political and economic power of merchants and mariners, particularly the wealthier members. Economics accelerated the Dutch revolt further. As the Netherlands, particularly the North, prospered, their traders established a vast economic network connecting Europe with Asia, Africa, and the Americas through shipping, navigation, commerce, and other lucrative industries like fishing, textiles, and banking. But, Spanish control of the regions imposed heavy taxation, primarily to fund their ambitious political and military ventures, and trade restrictions, endangering the commercial interests of Dutch elites and merchants, and ultimately aligning them with aspirations for political autonomy and free trade and commerce. Religion also played a significant role in the fight. The Dutch were dissatisfied with the Church of Rome and adopted various religions, including Lutheranism, Anabaptism, and Calvinism. The Dutch provinces primarily became Calvinist in the 16th century, while the Habsburg dynasty of Spain was Catholic, and they sought to suppress Protestantism and enforce Catholic orthodoxy with harsh measures, including the dreaded Inquisition. However, burghers and manual laborers valued political freedom over religious freedom. Burghers, or the bourgeoisie class, originally referred to an inhabitant of a walled town or borough, were merchants, craftsmen, and professionals who lived in medieval European towns and cities. They were between the aristocracy and the rural peasants in hierarchy. They drove metropolitan economies, trade networks, marketplaces, and industries. The town councils, stiffened by militant Calvinists, provided additional reasons for the poor and lowly to follow the burgher, who could give them work and a livelihood. Calvinism had originally found more adherents in the southern Netherlands than in the northern provinces, and the division was initially expected to crystallize along an east-west axis, with Antwerp having a strong Calvinist community. However, the stricter elements among the Calvinists there prevented the implementation of this policy. The Roman Catholic inhabitants of the lands of the Generality were not allowed political or voting rights. Further, the Spanish rulers of the southern Netherlands were more determined to stamp out heresy in the provinces controlled by the church and king. A strong force under the Duke of Parma, Alexander Farnese, captured Antwerp in 1585 and facilitated the surrender of Calvinists, who were allowed to emigrate and remove their capital and goods within two years' grace. This dispersal of Calvinism had far-reaching consequences. Wealthy and ambitious southern Dutch refugees from the south boosted the burgher elite and their power in the north. Emigrants had family and business contacts in Europe, especially in the Baltic and Levant. In Amsterdam, these emigrants' wealth and business ties boosted their commerce. Between 1585 and 1622, Amsterdam's population grew by 75,000 with one-third being southern Dutch immigrants or their descendants. Further, in the last decade of the 16th century, Flemish and Walloon merchants in Iberian and Mediterranean ports helped the Dutch grow their trading to new heights. The Dutch dominated trade between Brazil and Europe by 1621 after exploiting new markets during the Eighty Years' War. The Dutch also created the Arctic trade route to Russia during those years but their most spectacular outburst was directed at the spice trade in the East Indies. Dutch merchants who had sailed in Portuguese service discovered that Lisbon was creating a profitable spice market. In March 1594, some Dutch merchants found sufficient knowledge, inducements, and funds to organize a company of far lands at Amsterdam, sending two fleets to Indonesia for spices on April 2, 1596. The first fleet had no clear leader and only three ships and 89 out of 248 men returned to Texel on August 14, 1597. However, the modest cargo of pepper they brought from Bantam more than covered the cost of the expedition. Commercial companies for trading with the East Indies mushroomed, and rivalries between Holland and Zeeland became particularly acute. The States General advised the corporations to merge or collaborate rather than compete, which was initially rejected. But after long negotiations by Dutch statesman Johan van Oldenbarnevelt and Prince Maurice, the United Netherlands Chartered East India Company, VOC, was formed in 1602.
with a monopoly over Dutch trade and navigation for an initial period of 21 years east of the Cape of Good Hope and west of the Straits of Magellan. The governing body of 17 directors was empowered to conclude treaties of peace and alliance, wage defensive war, and build fortresses and strongholds in the region. However, the conclusion of the 12-year truce, 1609-1621, between Spain and the United Provinces delayed the formation of the West India Company for the Atlantic region, until 1621. The truce was ill-observed in the colonial world, and the official renewal of the war in 1621, after the trial and execution of Oldenbarnevelt on a trumped-up charge of high treason, gave both the VOC and the WIC great scope for offensive actions. The Dutch attack on the Iberian colonial world was directed far more against Portuguese possessions than against Spain. They captured Amboina in 1585 and concentrated on weaker Portuguese strongholds and settlements in the tropics, whether in the Moluccas, Malaya, Ceylon, or India. However, against the Spaniards in the Philippines, they were almost uniformly unsuccessful. The West India Company's attempts to found a New Netherlands on Manhattan Island and the banks of the Hudson River made only a modest showing. And the Portuguese rebellion in 1645 forced the Dutch to retire behind the walls of Recife and a few other places along the northeast Brazilian coast. The Treaty of Munster of 1648 marked the beginning of the United Provinces' Golden Age, with the Dutch becoming the world's greatest trading nation with three quarters of the traffic in Baltic grain, timber, and Swedish metals and being the largest importers and distributors of various colonial wares. This achievement was mainly due to the dynamic energy and enterprise generated in the seaports of Holland and Zeeland, which bore the financial brunt of the war against Spain and forged the spearhead of colonial expansions. The Treaty of Munster demonstrated that the movement that had started 80 years earlier had come to an end with the establishment of a loosely federated republic, run by a group of merchant oligarchs with a consciousness of nationality and recalling martial exploits. The Dutch could now confidently look forward to further expansion in the East Indies, and the possibility of creating an empire in the South Atlantic still existed. The Dutch Republic, which gained general recognition in 1648, faced criticism from crowned heads and trade rivals. But in general, in Europe, there was a favourable opinion of the Dutch seaborne empire, which had been a free state since then. The Dutch Republic was characterised by its youth, generosity, and friendly nature, making it a formidable force in wartime. The Dutch reached the height of their empire in the 17th century, when their maritime and colonial power was at its peak, thanks to the Dutch East India Company, VOC's strong foothold in Monsoon Asia.